All right, welcome everyone to Walleye Tank. Thank you so much for being here. How are we feeling? All right. <laughs> A little bit louder for our presenters. We're really, really excited to have them here. So shout out to our presenters who are going to be pitching. We're extremely excited to have you here at Walleye Tank in the Carlson School of Management. My name is Maria Plussel. I am the chief of staff who works with technology commercialization here at the U. Thank you so much for being here both in person and online via our YouTube channel. I'm Ron Thacker. I'm the Entrepreneurial Education Program Coordinator with Mayo Clinic. If you have never experienced Wally Tank, thank you. Uh, Wally Tank is Minnesota's premier life science startup uh, competition, and it was started in 2016 by Jamie Soundsbeck and Dr. Stephen Eckert as a way to celebrate the entire biomed tech entrepreneurial community. Today, Wally Tank has grown and provides an educational promotional opportunity and emerging and establishing medical and life science companies. Um, so we had a record number of applications this year. Wallet Tank, as Ron mentioned, has been going on a long time. So it was a very not enviable, difficult job for our selections committee. Um, we have 13 incredible companies who are going to be joining us today and an incredible panel of judges that you'll get to meet in just a moment. Um, if you've never experienced this before, this is the format. Each company gets two minutes to do a pitch, and then there are four minutes of Q&A with our expert panel of judges. Um, winners and runners-up of both divisions are going to receive cash prizes. This time around, we have two divisions, similar to um, if you were at Walleye Tank this past one in Mayo. Um, we have a junior division and a mid-level division. So we had a ton of applicants, uh, really, really competitive applicants come through. Most of them were in the junior and mid-level, so that's why you don't see a professional category or a student category this time. We only had a few of those in those. So um, the winner of the mid-level, in addition to the cash prize, also gets a coveted semifinalist spot in the Minnesota Cup. So. Yeah, shout out for the Minnesota Cup. All right. So um, this event is a collaboration between TechCom, Mayo's Office of Entrepreneurship, and the support of some incredible companies that you see above here, and organizations and institutions and entities. Um, this event wouldn't be possible without them, um, so please, please, please give our sponsors and all of our incredible volunteers a round of applause. So we have an incredible lineup, uh, but first it is my pleasure, it is my honor to introduce two leaders we have here at the University of Minnesota who will be sharing some remarks, welcoming you into the space. Um, first, I would like to introduce Associate Dean of the Carlson School of Management, Dr. Stephen Parente. So great to see you all here. Um, this is an activity that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm Associate Dean for the Carlson Global Institute, um, but I'm also a professor in the Finance Department and the longest serving director of what we call the Medical Industry Leadership Institute which gave birth to something known as the Medical Valuation Laboratory, which looks at any early stage med tech uh, technology. So any somebody who are actually competing have been in this project before. But in terms of welcoming the school, this, as you all know, Carlson is one of the premier business schools in the world, focused on entrepreneurship with the Home Center, run by John Stavik, and all the innovation that goes on in that space. We are blessed to be in the environment with the Mayo Clinic and the Entrepreneurship Partnership to make this thing actually happen. And just all the wonderful ideas that just come from the state. I am not a native of the state. I'm from suburban Philadelphia, kind of the East Coaster. Uh, I, I get back every once in a while just to see what's actually going on in DC. But I usually I'm much happier calling this place home. But in the 25 years I've been in Minnesota, I've been amazed at how much innovation comes from this state. For example, uh, what, what could possibly come from a pontoon boat on Christmas Lake? How about HMOs? Uh, how about actually someone who was coming up with the notion of HMOs recruiting a young person named Richard Burke, who really was really young at the time and advised another thing called the Hennepin County Medical That's Center to create something called sure United Health Care, later called United Health Group. 
We're the first consumer-driven health plan, uh, actually several different ones that started just 25 years ago that later were acquired and advanced the whole concept of price transparency, health savings accounts, and a lot of the dot-com issues that we see today. Let alone uh, Medtronic's whole story, St. Jude, and everything else that goes along with it. We are blessed to be in this community to have such a hotbed of innovation, and I'm thrilled that you've all come to the Carlson School in this auditorium before we totally destroy it and renovate it, <laughs> uh, which will happen in the next year, and come back to see something brand new uh, for another walleye tag. So congratulations, uh, finalists, you made it this far. This is awesome. Have a wonderful time. You'll never forget it. Take care. Thank you so much. Next up, I'm pleased to introduce the Vice Dean of Research of the Medical School, Dr. Peter Crawford. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to join you today. I'm seeing an, a good number of familiar faces and a good number of new faces. Uh, this is an amazing event. I understand this is the 17th round of this. It's held twice a year uh, uh, between Rochester and the Twin Cities. Uh, we've got eight different administrative units uh, among uh, multiple uh, institutions that are supportive of this event. Um, incredibly exciting. A number of in, uh, great successes with companies that have uh, been acquired and have done, uh, gone on to do great things. I don't have to tell almost everybody in this um, audience what an amazing place Minnesota is, uh, what a cradle of innovation we are. So it makes all the sense in the world that, uh, that this, uh, this group of leaders, of thought leaders, of young um, innovators is coming together and um, having opportunities um, in this way. I also love the partnership that this represents between the University of Minnesota and Mayo. We have um, multiple arms of this. Uh, we, we do this um, through funding mechanisms. For example, those that are overseen, uh, at, uh, at least on our side, and I see uh, Sandra Wells here by our Office of Discovery and Translation. Uh, we have uh, multiple mechanisms that support and cultivate uh, uh, technology domains, um, and we're obviously incredibly excited to partner um, with, uh, with uh, Mayo, and these funding mechanisms are designed to um, incorporate partnerships between the University of Minnesota and Mayo by design um, in moving things forward. I also want to underscore um, a piece that's very exciting for the region, and that is an, an application uh, for a phase two um, hub component uh, of a mechanism that originated from the Federal Economic Development Agency um, called Minnesota, uh, Minnesota MedTech 3.0. This is an application that that involved 39 different organizations and about 190 different individuals that came together um, in a four-month period to apply for funding um, for a program that's oriented around job creation. But our theme is around smart med tech um, in our proposal, and it in involves, um, obviously, a, a a component, a key component of job creation in a community service-based approach through digital health and information systems. We contributed significantly to a couple of components called the Minkubator, as well as the North Star Data Alliance. This is a, a, another great representation of the partnership between the University of Minnesota. Uh, the Mayo uh, Destination Medical Center also had a key component of that. And so, uh, again, um, in this energy that, that I um, can palpate today and that, uh, that was represented in this um, application as we move forward through this kind of initiative and others like it. It's very exciting. So congratulations to the 13 finalists. I, I understand it's 13 finalists that have that advanced to this stage. Just that achievement is incredible. Um, irrespective of the outcome of today, I know that all of the finalists are going to move on and do amazingly innovative things in, in their careers um, as they move forward. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you for the opportunity. And on behalf of uh, the Dean of the Medical School, Jacob Tolar, um, we're thrilled to see all the wonderful things that are happening here. And I thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, who is ready to go fishing? <laughs> no one? <laughs> All right, we are gonna kick it off with the junior division, and Ron, I will pass it over to you. We have seven companies uh, competing today in the junior division. First, let's meet the judges. Pete Marsnick, Kyle Brandy, Tom Gunderson, Rashmi Kwandal, and Jeff Rearson. Thank you, judges. All right, first pitch of the day. We have Kelly Van Ert, Indep uh, Empower Independence Company, and Catalago Biotech. You're on deck.
Am I going the wrong way? I am. Okay. I'm Kelly Van Art, occupational therapist, problem solver, and founder of Empower Independence Company. Consider someone in your life who has slowed down or struggles, an aging parent or grandparent, a coworker with chemo, a friend going through a chronic illness. We see these hardships, whether they share the daily, the impact, excuse me, uh, we see these hardships, whether they share the intimate details of how it impacts their daily lives or not. As an occupational therapist, I have assessed hundreds of adults in their bathing environment. Through patient feedback and customer discovery, we've highlighted three main concerns. A slick environment, this includes slippery bath products and shower head. Inaccessibility, items must be placed on a small ledge, on the ground, in a tiny hook. Fatigue, the energy required to access these items is too much. Simply shower is the solution for conserving energy, reducing fall risks, increasing accessibility, and allowing energy to be spent on more valued activities. <clears throat> Simply shower includes magnetic adjustable sleeves for a variety of commonly used shower items and an adjustable magnetic board. It is a safety enhancing accessory that can be added to any shower. The current prototype integrates a grad bar option to meet the <clears throat> needs of our beachhead market. Our total market focuses on adults over the age of 65 and individuals who are currently struggling with physical disabilities. Our obtainable market focuses on adults who are currently struggling to complete self-care independently. If we capture just a fourth of those individuals who are actively looking to retain their independence, our obtainable market will be 15 million. Our Minnesota-based team of experts is motivated to bring Simply Shower to market. Please help me enable millions of Americans to increase their safety, their independence, confidence, and joy through <clears throat> Simply Shower. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Um, good pitch. Um, Congratulations for not only um, doing this, but being the first. Thank so, you. <laughs> good for you. Uh, the quick. hole right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And navigating the floor that will be removed. The um, question I have is, where are you as far as your development of the product? And do you have an MVP or anything that's in the hands of customers at this time? So we're uh, currently at our fourth prototype, and we actually have just been in conversations this week with an engineering group out of Seattle, Washington, who has brought a lot of medical devices, prosthetics to market, and they're gonna partner with us to help us get that MVP. Uh, we're also really excited about a collaboration that we're having with a Nebraska rehab hospital where they're gonna help us uh, do market testing. So we're not only gonna get feedback from patients in this rehab, area where they're actively looking to get people independent and home, but we're also gonna have that team of therapists and doctors and nurses that are there to also look at that product while we're market testing it, which will be fantastic. There is another small facility where I live in Bemidji, Minnesota that will also be market testing it, so I will have eyes on that as well. Good afternoon, great job. Thank you. Um, I love the idea. Um, how are you anticipating getting to market, direct to market, through Amazon, through um, building or bathroom remodelers or great, how? Great question. Yes, so we actually have a few streams that we're really excited about. The first is just direct to market. And our marketing team has shown us that for our beachhead market, Facebook ads are very popular and highly rated. Uh, we also have a connection with AARP mailers where we're going to be able to send out what we do to those people. And we think that that's going to bring in um, people to our site and then to adaptive equipment sites as well. Um, the other area that we're excited about is hospital retail stores and therapy stores. So uh, there's 13 million aging adults that are leaving the hospital every year in the US and they are actively looking for how they're gonna get back home and be safer and more independent. This would be another option as they leave the hospital. The therapists are recommending their shower bench and their sock aid. This would be another thing that they could exit the hospital with, with their families um, to help them be more independent at home. The third area that we're looking at is new builds. By 2030, there's gonna be one million units needed to accommodate the 55 plus communities, assisted living, skilled nursing, 
living independent facilities, and we would like this to be one of those pieces that are in those new builds, right? They, they ask therapists to come in and help them set up the bathrooms for these people to be able to stay and maintain and age in place, and we would be uh, right there with them at that new build so that it would be prepared for them to get into that bathroom and be able to be independent for a long time. A really good presentation, Kelly. Um, so the question is, um, when you are, uh, are you only selling the product or are you also including the bathroom? Like, will it take bathroom remodeling included in it? Not. So we have, uh, we're working on semi-permanent options. So like vacuum sealed suction cups are what we're testing right now for, you know, the fiberglass showers. Um, for tile options, we're looking at actually screw in, like what you would do with a, a grab bar to make sure that it's in the studs uh, for our permanent option. But with this new engineering group, they have a couple new ideas um, to see what we can do for our permanent and non-permanent. But our plans are that you're going to be able to put it in any shower that you have. Yeah, and one final question, Kelly. What, what's the price point that you're thinking about with this product? Sure. So right now we're still playing with materials and such with our prototypes, but based on material and production, we're looking at around $200. And as an adaptive equipment um, criteria, it would be something that could be paid for from like your HSA account. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I, I need to make a quick correction. Um, one of our judges uh, from MCV, our Mayo Clinic Ventures, was unable to come. And so uh, Keen Wynn replaced Kyle Brandy. I apologize, I, I, uh, I missed it. So next up, we have Jonathan Fink with Catalago Biotech and Family Care. You're on deck. Hello, my name is Jordan Fink, and I am a co-founder of Catalago Biotech. Stefan was admitted to the hospital with vomiting, fever, and delirium. His doctor suspects a blood infection and orders a blood culture test. Yet that blood culture test will take two to five days in order to get the results. In the meantime, Stefan's doctor has to attempt to save Stefan's life, but how do you treat something when you don't exactly know what it is? This exact situation occurs 1.7 million times a year in the US alone. Doctors are essentially guessing about which antibiotics to use to treat their patients. This has resulted in blood infections being the number one reason for hospital readmission, a 20% mortality rate, and $62 billion in annual costs. This is overtly due to poor diagnostics. With the third highest error rate, 80% of deaths are preventable with better diagnostics, and 19% of patients are incorrectly treated. Diagnosis is hard, though. 56% of patients actually present with nonspecific symptoms. But if treatment can occur within the first hour, there can be a decrease by 45% in the mortality rate. This suggests that rapid and standard of care pathogen testing would save hundreds of thousands of lives every single year. This is exactly our goal. Our technology, we believe, will satisfy the rapid diagnostic times and provide pathogen-specific information to doctors, giving clarity on how to treat their patients. It's also highly mobile, which would open up new point of care uh, capacities. We believe now is the time to strike. The market is clearly in dire need for rapid diagnostics. Available technologies that weren't even around last year make our devices now possible. And care at home initiatives uh, that are currently limited by uh, current diagnostic uh, capabilities. With our established uh, medium term plan, we will, over the next 12 months, continue with prototype development, enabling B2B customer validation, which will allow field testing and regulatory approval. We have a fantastic team of innovative scientists. I am currently a late stage doctoral candidate with experience in product development and commercialization, but we have other members that have experience in clinical translation and uh, biotech startups. We are also currently looking for mentors with experience in regulatory approval, so if you'd like to join us, please contact us. Thank you. Yeah, great presentation, Jordan. Thank you very much for that. Can you talk about uh, where your intellectual property is with this technology? Yeah, that's a great question. It is currently, we're currently moving forward with building our patent portfolio. So, so I can't talk too much about it, but that's exactly what we're in process with right now. So 
So in the write up you talked about Candida. Can you can you give us a little bit of a sense is this a battery of tests that you envision or are yeah. you doing it one off? How how are you introducing these tests? Yeah, so uh, pathogen testing, there's multiple different pathogens that you could test for obviously. Candida is a uh, is kind of our first attempt that we're looking to pursue. It has a really high mortality rate. It's a fungus and it has pretty explicit biomarkers so that you can test for those specific biomarkers. Uh, and then after that, we believe that this is a platform technology and we can expand it to other pathogens and make it more broad. And that expansion also shouldn't increase the size of the product um, very much at all. So it still would allow point of care diagnostics as well. Oh, thank you, Jordan. Do you see the product as, you talk about mobile there, but is it mostly in the lab or will it be yeah. used remotely? And how quick do you get the, do you think you'll be getting the information back? Yeah, uh, so our first look at this is to get into the hand of diagnostics labs at hospitals. It's kind of our beachhead market right now. Uh, moving forward, we do think that we can make this technology easy to use and portable so that it can be transported and used more in the fields, uh, not just in hospital diagnostics uh, labs. Are you working with any of the strategics because strategics have such strong relationships with hospitals and their labs? It'd be good to d start developing those now. Yeah, we're establishing those relationships right now. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Gordon, next up we have Tyler Worth with Family Care, Stonehenge Software. You're on deck. Hello, I'm Tyler Worth, founder of Family Care. Caring for a loved one is very difficult, and we're on a mission to help dementia caregivers beat the snot out of logistical and emotional stress. Meet Mary. Mary recently moved her father next door to care for him. And as his dementia has progressed, Mary's barely hanging on as she rides the emotional roller coaster of caregiving. And you see Mary's part of 11 million d dementia caregivers in the US looking for help as she's worn down to a point that it's impacting her own health. And trust me, she is looking for help. She's looking for ways to delete the distance, to better connect with family, She's looking for a better sense of direction because a lot of times she doesn't even know where to start when something new comes up. She's sitting with her feet hanging over the edge of a caregiving cliff. And she needs help right now. And family care can provide that help. Imagine jumping in your car, hitting the road, and a message pops up and says, you're likely to get a flat tire in about 10 miles. What would you do? Now imagine getting another message that says there's a station just down the road that for $15 can fix those wheels and get you back on the road. Well, that's exactly what Family Care does. Through our adaptive care map and predictive AI, we help caregivers see the path ahead to deal with issues before they become problems. We want caregivers to find and stay on the right path of providing great care and not get knocked off because of the unexpected. With 10,000 people turning 65 every day, the U.S. spend on caregiving is enormous. And the impact of family care is at an arm's length of everyone in this auditorium. With a free version working to convert users to premium, our obtainable market is 1.6 billion, and we are on a wonderful path as we develop our MVP and close in on launch. We have a good handle on the sales side for family care, and my ask of you today is twofold. We need introductions to those with health care expertise, and second, we need funding to build this wonderful technology. Now, I don't condone violence, but thank you for your time today as we help Mary fight stress. Thank you. So thanks, Tyler. That was a good presentation. I'm, I'm wondering about, it's a, big problem, as you've said, Huge. and there's lots of different solutions that are out there now and in the works. How would you, how do you position yourself? How do you see yourself 
uh, relative to competition? Sure. Um, a lot of competition out there either leans towards emotional support or logistical support. Family care aims to do both. I'll give you an example. Um, in the adaptive care map, which is a mind map tool that your family and, and collaborators can all work together on, when you say enter a term like memory care, the AI will read that and provide a logistical support piece. Uh, you might receive an article on the top 15 places within 20 miles um, for memory care. And then you'll receive an emotional component as well. Um, moving to memory care is a very, very difficult thing for most families. Here are some um, insightful ways that you can talk about this with your loved ones. And in addition, um, we're working on putting it together milestones of problems that happen down the road. These might be things that happen within 30 days of moving to a facility. These might be things that happen 60 to 90 days after, so that caregiver's not surprised. Great question. Great presentation, Tyler. Um, either, does this have an option of connecting with other caregivers? We are working on um, looking at that. I initially uh, did not choose to work with a, a HIPAA compliant version. Um, I think in our first test phase, we're going to really see what the users want. If they need that, I think it will be a very attractive um, addition. And I think that um, it could potentially be a great exit plan uh, to partner with a company that wants to add it to their patient portal. Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Joe Gogler here at the University of Minnesota? I am not. Um, I'll tell you more about him later. Wonderful. Uh, um, on June 1st, he's hosting a free um, caring for people with dementia uh, workshop that's pretty well known within the regional uh, caregiving world with lots of people that you could talk to and connect with. Wonderful, thank you. And I didn't plan the Mary in the, <laughs> I really didn't. <laughs> A, uh, a question around your app development, Tyler. What, what do you plan to use for information to train the uh, AI software for its predictive capabilities? Sure. Well, and that's part of my ask is I need help on the technical, you know, the med tech side of things. Uh, but my understanding is that we can put together a database and feed as much information into that as, that, as we can. That is where it will pull a bulk of the information. Um, so it will take some time to build that. Um, it, I think it will be a you know version 2.0 uh, release for some of the AI functionality. Great question, thank you. Yeah, I had uh, similar to that. Uh, when you when you build the app, will it be particularly an app, or would you have a website as well? And when sure, you, as, especially if you're linking to other um, sure. solutions. Sure, um, there are some platforms out there that have both right now. Um, with 66 percent of people of caregivers falling into the Gen X and um, baby boomers. Right now, the, the baby boomers are a little bit more, but that line is coming to parity, and it's going to flip-flop the other way very shortly. Um, where we'll see less baby boomer caregivers and more younger. Um, and so with, with that, we see that the mobile app is going to be a more powerful tool and, and have probably a wider reach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Next up, Eric Weinberger with Stonehenge Software, Vertex Medical Solutions. You're on deck. Numbers of hospitals will become extinct unless they improve their patient outcomes. Improving outcomes means improving processes, both process design and process compliance. But who can afford to focus on every step of every process? The software application process measure identifies the process steps 
with the greatest potential for outcome improvement based on how often each step is missed or misperformed and its impact on outcomes. Process measure has been in use for a year at a hospital that has used it to obtain recertification as a regional stroke center. The inspectors were impressed with the use of process measure to improve outcomes for stroke patients. The hospital says that process measure is easy to use and that the ease with which performance graphs can be obtained is truly impressive. The hospital adds, we're excited about spreading the use of this tool to other acute care situations in the hospital. Our team includes two attorneys to keep me on the straight and narrow, a healthcare systems engineer, and a geek who gives orders to machines to do what he says, but not always what he means. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. So uh, you said this is being tested for stroke right now. Uh, so as the disease state changes, uh, do you have to uh, change the process, uh, like the steps in the process or the software for different diseases, or does it stay standardized for across various disease states? Great question. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to introduce Devesh Tahali from Alabama. He is one of the members of the team there, the, the Director of Health Systems Engineering at Southeast Health. And I have met him today for the first time in person, even though I've been talking to him for five and a half years. Back to your question. The program, so the hospital defines its processes within this program. So you can define any process you want for any situation you want. It's completely customizable. Does that answer the question? Okay, good. Okay. I'm, I'm curious when you try to solve problems within a hospital and they're not usually receptive to, here, we want to correct your errors for you. Um, how do you get input of the information that the machine is sifting through to give you the answers? Is it in most healthcare that I've run into, it's human input. Is that what this is, and how do you get over the hump of, we don't make mistakes here, that's at the do hospital down the street? Thank you, great question. I'll let Devesh answer that since he actually does. Yeah, so yeah, uh, Devesh, they are actually the users of the software that we have co-created. And uh, the way uh, things work in healthcare, being in the midst of it, is that oftentimes we are held accountable to the overall outcome. Uh, for example, one of the measures that you're all, all aware of in the stroke world would be the growth in needle times for patients receiving thrombolytics. So when we evaluate an outcome, typically teams come together and say, how did we do with regard to this particular patient? And when we do that evaluation, it's oftentimes very random in nature. What went well, what did not go well, and does not have a very good structure. So our intent here was to actually establish that structure, but also make it measurable. And the structure really comes from uh, people who are knowledgeable about the process. For example, it could be somebody as simple as saying, did I identify the stroke in a timely manner? AKA they call the code stroke, which gets announced across the whole hospital. It could be something uh, which is in the nursing realm with regard to from the time that the pharmacist actually delivered that uh, TPA, did the nurse actually administer the finish on the these are two examples of the questions that we would include in terms of the steps that are followed from the time that the need is identified to the time that we get measured with regard to this. So where do the inputs come from? They come from uh, the clinical team, typically. And what do we do with it? We arrange it in such a way that that captured information then gives us insights into which steps are actually causing the biggest issue. Thank you, Devesh.
Thank you, Eric. Before we jump into our next presenter, let's hear from two of our incredible sponsors and partners. First, I'd like to invite up Paul Carlson of Clifton Larson Allen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Carlson. I'm a principal with CLA uh, in our life science practice. Um, CLA is a professional services firm, about the eighth largest uh, professional services firm in the nation, uh, but the only firm of our size that focuses almost exclusively on privately held businesses and their owners, including startups. Uh, we were founded in Minneapolis, um, and in, to date it's our largest office. We have just over a thousand people here. And, um, within our healthcare and life science practice, uh, we serve a lot of startups and we really pride ourselves in working closely with the entrepreneurs, the business owners uh, to help uh, assess and mitigate financial risk, um, help grow their company and ultimately achieve the future that you envision for the company. So we're really excited to help sponsor this event. Um, great job to all the presenters and those that are yet to come and we look forward to a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next, let's hear from Rod, pardon me, Rob Comperman, Director of Launch Minnesota. Hi, uh, thank you, great to be here. A um, Couple of quick things. How many of you know anything about Launch Minnesota? I know a few of you do. Wow, pretty good, pretty good uh, raise of hands there. Very cool. Um, Many of you may know more than I do. I've only been here about four months now. Um, it's been uh, a really cool, thank you for calling out the hole, by the way. Uh, very, very cool experience for me. Most of my career was in, in big corporates. Uh, a little bit of time working with Russ on the business advisory group, um, as well as uh, some work in higher ed. Um, but that launched me into my dream job in state government. It's a, a laugh line, come on guys. No, uh, but seriously, it's, it's been fantastic. And the reason why it's so cool is I get to come to events like this, feel the energy with all of you who are trying to start new things. I get to work with higher ed. I get to work with venture capital strategics and uh, support organizations to try to elevate the overall ecosystem here in Minnesota. So uh, one of the big things we do are uh, direct innovation grants into startups, which are uh, up to $35,000 for uh, startups that meet eligibility criteria and get through kind of the gauntlet that we have. Um, I'd encourage any of our anglers who haven't uh, applied to go ahead and do that. Uh, one, one big reason why is that we found that in the five years of our program, uh, we've issued seven and a half million dollars worth of grants. Uh, those awardees have gone on to raise 150 million in capital, so about $20 for every dollar of grant money. Uh, post award. So, uh, and that's not all off one unicorn, that's off about 50 plus grantees that have gone on to raise money. So it's a great program. I uh, appreciate all the support of everybody here who, who takes part in it and uh, look forward to seeing a lot more great, uh, great applicants coming through. So thank you. Thank you. All right, back to fishing. Next up, we have Mo Hicks with Vertex Medical Solutions, Salamander Life Systems. You're on deck. When I think about the future of healthcare, I picture a world where health isn't just about the next pill or procedure. It's about addressing the root causes of illness. Housing insecurity, food scarcity, mental health crises, these health-related social needs are often the real threats to healthy living. Addressing social drivers of health is not just a crisis. This is an epidemic of inefficiency as healthcare spending continues to rise, while the health of vulnerable communities in need of social care continues to suffer. At Vertex, we're taking a transformative approach to this problem. Our social care coordination platform equips care providers with tools to assess for social risk factors before providing social resources to address them. Although there are other digital solutions in this space, this platform goes beyond by empowering healthcare providers with trauma-informed tools that are needed to promote trust in the care coordination process. This isn't just another tech solution. This is a collaborative, integrative leap forward in how we provide trauma-informed, value-based healthcare. 
Recent guidance from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Joint Commission actually spotlights the necessity for addressing social drivers of health. Moreover, the advent of new medical reimbursement pathways for social care coordination underscores a pivotal shift in our healthcare paradigm. We are at the threshold of a new era where integrating social care into healthcare is not just optional, but essential. Integrating social care into healthcare also presents a significant opportunity to improve health outcomes while simultaneously reducing unnecessary healthcare expenditures. By addressing health-related social needs in high-cost settings such as emergency departments, we can not only alleviate a significant strain on our healthcare system, but also pave the way forward for more sustainable value-based care models. Now what sets me apart from other tech entrepreneurs is the clinical experience that I have in working with this problem firsthand. I've worked with patients who have been suffering by not having the resources needed to live a healthy life. My entrepreneurial journey has been molded by these firsthand experiences and a commitment to heal not just patients, but the healthcare system itself. If you'd like to join me on this, on this mission to redefine the future of healthcare, please reach out to me via LinkedIn or email if you're interested in being a potential advisor, investor, or partner. Thank you. So, great job, Mo. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Thanks. Um, so, you're a busy guy. A bit, just a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, how do you foresee taking this forward given all of your um, school responsibilities? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say the time constraints has probably been one of the most significant challenges in the past couple of years, balancing medical school and, and business school with the startup as well. Um, but it has absolutely taught me the um, how essential it is to have a good team around you. Um, so I would say in the past half year or so, uh, that has been one of my most critical endeavors is to build an effective team um, and have the right resources around me so I can rely on them as we start pilots in the fall and um, work towards uh, our, our market strategy and, and launching in 2025. Um, so that, that has been a critical piece as I've uh, surrounded myself with a very effective CTO, um, a chief strategic officer as well that's been very effective throughout this process, um, and a couple of other business partners and consultants who've been very effective in this past, uh, in this past phase. Uh, th thank you, Maurice. Nice uh, presentation. Um, go into a little more for me. What is um, trauma-informed tools, and then specifically, are you targeting Medicaid through the states or through the service and medical providers themselves? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start with trauma-informed care. This is a care modality that um, is, is not uh, commonly known, especially in the digital health space, um, but kind of talks around recognizing the impacts and effects of uh, trauma on uh, daily living and looking at the long-lasting uh, impacts of it. Um, and this is a very critical modality when it comes to social care coordination because a lot of the patients that are suffering um, from social needs are coming from vulnerable communities where they've experienced various levels of trauma, um, which significantly impacts the provider-patient relationship. Um, so in terms of uh, actually understanding how to address the, the problem of social care coordination, um, the importance of promoting trust and building that connection between providers and patients and really understanding what those critical needs are in that care coordination process, I think is something that's commonly overlooked um, and is an essential piece in terms of effectively figuring out what resources these patients really need. Um, so there are a few different ways that our platform encourages uh, the, uh, it empowers the users uh, of trauma-informed care through trauma screening, um, through trauma-informed care plans where we can uh, look at the aspects of a patient's trauma history that's relevant to the visit today, um, while also providing trauma-informed education for organizations that want to become trauma-informed on an organizational level and implement that into some of their change management strategies. In terms of your second question um, about uh, kind of our target population, so this would be a Medicaid solution um, where we would be targeting Medicaid insurers um, as that particular patient population tends to suffer, suffer most significantly um, from the social risk factors. Um, so that would be the target population that we would be targeting, um, going with a per member per month uh, pricing model to uh, cater towards those insurers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great presentation. Thank you for that. You, you talked about your current um, target customer as uh, Medicaid insurers. Yeah. What, what sort of voice of the customer have you, have you received from your target? And um, what sort of feedback do they have in, in um, the uh, structure of the platform? Yeah, so 
In terms of voice of the customer, this is part of the reason why I feel like trauma-informed care is a significant differentiator of this platform. Um, as the fractured trust in a lot of these clinical settings has been a really large impediment in terms of effective social care coordination. Uh, so that's one piece that I feel uh, will be a really critical piece in getting this care coordination problem right. Uh, in terms of other critical users and thinking about you know, who are the actual users of this platform as this is a B2B solution, and it would primarily be physicians, nurses, social workers that are initially assessing these social risk factors. There's also been critical considerations in um, the actual clinical workflow of how these uh, social risk uh, factors are generally assessed um, that we've also taken into account with how we've tailored some of the user interface um, and some of the design with the platform to make sure that we're actually being responsive to customer needs in a way that other solutions might not necessarily do. Thank you, Mo. Next up, we have Brian Balquist with Salamander Life Systems. Emergence, you're on deck. Hi, my name is Brian Balquist, and my company, Salamander Life Systems, uses wastewater surveillance to fight diseases in our agriculture. Every year, viral outbreaks cause hundreds of millions of dollars of damage to our agricultural industry and cause significant loss of animal life. Wastewater surveillance provides a solution to this problem. Using the same system that we use at the municipal level to test for COVID-19, we can monitor the presence and concentration of viruses in our animal wastewater and use that to make decisions about our herd management and herd health. Wastewater surveillance is in a unique position right now. There's significant demand from major agricultural players for new biosecurity technologies, and they have the deep pockets to make that happen. Additionally, there's minimal competition in the landscape. It's a very infant technology. The current few major players are all focusing on those municipal contracts. Additionally, they're also not looking at automation in the agriculture space. Currently, we have identified short and long-term paths to revenue. The majority of our initial revenue would come from capital system sales to major players and farmers as well as recurring revenue from the sale of consumables, such as filters and chemical reagents. Longer term, we're looking to partner with veterinary pharmaceutical manufacturing companies to help develop herd-specific vaccines, as well as the sale of data on animal health to uh, financial institutions for their trading activities, and possible further diversity into additional species and monitoring avenues in the agriculture space. Right now, we have conducted significant consumer research, and we are confident that the consumers de the demand a solution like we are providing to the problems they have. We're working on bench scale prototyping right now, but what we need are team members with specialty backgrounds as well as additional funding to complete these prototypes before we can implement on our partner farms. I hope you'll join me and Salamander Life Systems in ushering in a new era of biosecurity. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, talk to me later about uh, filtering swine manure back in a previous lifetime. Perfect. It's uh, interesting. A uh, question for you on the, um, on the business model. You talk about the short-term and longer-term revenue. Yes. And are you looking at the data? Is, is it in the hands of the user, or is it something you connect to to do the right. data? So. Yeah. Current thought process is that the farm-specific data would be maintained by the user. A lot of farms, it's a very private industry, both economically and you know, personally. A lot of people don't want people poking around their farms. That goes along with their data. We would likely work to retain the right to some more aggregate data, which still provides trends in, you know, say, the commodity prices of pork or beef, but not necessarily saying, oh, this specific farm has an outbreak on this day because a lot of farms, they're just not going to play that game if you're giving away that data like that. I'll jump in with one more. Yeah. Um, the, uh, is the size of the farm a consideration, or what, what would, yeah. what's the cost going to be for a, exactly. a big farm? So I've got here some market size data. Right, The USDA alone has budgeted roughly $140 million to swine uh, and biosecurity concerns. Looking at some of the largest players, right, we have T 
10 uh, major pork producers in the US that kind of run the most of sow farms. And we're targeting the breeding sows because they're the most valuable animals. They're far more valuable than like the meat pigs. And so we're looking at farms that have thousands of pigs on them rather than tens or hundreds because there simply is that much more money at stake. And an outbreak uh, on a farm with 5,000 sows on it, it's gonna cost you about a million bucks. When you think of the future of your company, do you see yourself running this forever or are you looking to exit and who to? Yeah, so in the short to medium term, definitely would be something that would be run you know, with the initial team on board. But yes, the, the agriculture industry is very, very competitive. There are very large entrenched players and it would likely make some of the most strategic sense to partner with some of those major uh, agricultural technology companies, you know, Cargill for one, other manufacturers, and then work within them as opposed to against them because, uh, yes, it would be a concern that someone could come along and eat your lunch. I don't have a question, but um, if you want to talk later, I might have some connections for you. Perfect, thank you. Brian. Next up, we have Hannah Burgum with Emergence. Hi, my name is Hannah, and I, and I am a co-founder of Emergence. In 2023, just under 300,000 men were diagnosed with prostate cancer. 90,000 will undergo a radical prostatectomy for treatment of their disease. 60,000 undergo decipher prostate testing to determine the aggressiveness of their cancer, but 15,000 patients are miscategorized. This results in patients with high-risk disease being undertreated and patients with low-risk disease being overtreated. This 25% miscategorization rate comes from these companion prognostic tests use less than 50 genes to make their predictions. At Emergence, we do things a little differently. We integrate thousands of variables and examine over 40 million interactions. And this allows us to accurately predict the events of the 25% who were previously miscategorized. Prostate cancer diagnostics is currently over a $4 billion market. As an adjuvant technology, we're focused on emerging players already in the space of clinical genomics, like Decipher. We can sell our improved tool to them directly, or we can partner with them to co-develop. But where are we going? Prognostics is not the only market in prostate cancer. Prostate is not the only cancer type, and cancer is not the only disease. We have opportunity and capacity to branch into these other areas, but our entry is focused on prostate. As you can see, we've done a great deal of groundwork developing patents and products and establishing academic collaborations. We're currently focused on developing the second version of our approach and acquiring patient data with clinical endpoints. Our team has worked together for more than five years and combined our expertise covers the gambit of what we need for emergence to be successful. Today, we're asking for up to two million in tranche. We need funding to support our idea and for a senior executive who would manage business development who is interested in defining the future of cancer care. Thank you. That was great, Hannah. Thank you very much for that. Um, Two-part question, as you think about your solution and your product, how, what, what is your plan to validate its efficacy? And then second is, um, what is your thought on the regulatory pathway for your solution? Big questions right off the bat. So when we think about validating our approach, we're developing in the academic setting, we're using publicly available data from patients. And then when we're going to partner with those customers, we're then validating on the data that they have from their tools that they're already developed. So when a patient comes in and receives a, gets a biopsy and then sends their tissue off to these companies, they're sequencing thousands of genes. That data is there, but that data is not being leveraged to guide clinical decision making. And that's where we come in. We're leveraging that data. In terms of the, of the regulatory pathway, Currently, these LDTs are not FDA approved. They don't need to be FDA approved, but that decision is pending in April. That decision is coming up. That could be changed, so we are really on the lookout for what that could mean for our company going forward, but we're discussing it behind the scenes. 
get one more question on the on the solution itself. Is this taking the place of like the the PSA testing, or is this more down um, pathology with a biopsy type of? Yes, we're, we're not, in the process, is it? Yeah, not taking, the not taking the place of PSA testing. That's still very standard of care and early detection for prostate cancer. Currently, we're a little bit more downstream than that. So we're looking at predicting recurrence, and we're predicting aggressiveness of disease. We're looking to improve those current. This is a rapidly evolving field. How will you stay ahead? building a great team of people that are looking at cutting edge approaches. I think our team of scientists that we have, the advantage that we have with our team is we're building these algorithms as we speak. So AI and machine learning are changing the game when it comes to data in this space, bringing on team members that can not only utilize those approaches, but innovate new ones to understand how we, how we move to the next step. That's really what we're doing. And our team currently does that, um, and we're looking to expand always. job. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Hannah. Um, that concludes the junior division. So thank you to our junior judges. Round of applause for them. All right. Next up, we're going to bring up the mid-level reelers. So um, junior judges, if you can take another seat, and the mid-level judges, if you can come to the front. Um, as we're getting ready, I'd like to invite up two other incredible sponsors and partners to say a few words. So first up, I'd like to invite Brad. Where's Brad? There he is. Brad is the executive director of University Enterprise Labs. <laughs> right. Um, so hey, everybody. My name is Brad. I'm the executive director at UEL. Um, we are a life science incubator in Minnesota. And so what that really looks like is we kind of classify ourselves as a launch pad for early stage life science companies. So for those that don't know, there is a significant shortage of lab space in Minnesota, especially for a startup. So as we think about the broader startup ecosystem and concept, it's a lot different in life sciences than it is in something like CPG, right? They can't just do these types of chemical work inside their garage. And so where we come in is we have found out over the last 20 years that early stage companies need a place to start. What often happens is these, a lot of these life science companies tend to be pre-revenue. So as a result, when they try and go get space, whether that be a commercial loan of some sort, what ends up happening is there's not a viable option. So over the last 20 years, we've partnered with many organizations. We've had more than 150 companies come out of our space. And usually our data is showing that around 60 to 70% of them, 60 to 70% of them are able to relocate into space upon leaving UEL. So we get really excited to come to these types of events. Like Rob, I'm like 95 days in, so I'm still drinking the Kool-Aid, trying to drink from the fire hose at the same time. So if anyone's in need of any lab space, come talk to me. Our occupancy is always at 100%, but we try to find ways to work with emerging startups. Thank you, Brad. All right, next up, let's hear from Kaylin Oliver, um, who's the Associate Director of Minnesota Cup, and Deb Miedma, an Innovation Outreach and Development Specialist um, with MinCore. Hi, everyone. Um, Maria mentioned, my name is Kaylin Oliver. I am the Associate Director for Minnesota Cup. Deb and I are here today from the Home Center for Entrepreneurship, which is an entrepreneurship hub based here at the Carlson School but supporting entrepreneurs across Minnesota. We're just upstairs on the second floor. So just wanna give you a few words about what Minnesota Cup is. We are a statewide startup competition supporting Minnesota's entrepreneurs across the state. And we run an annual competition that offers an opportunity for you to receive access to education, mentorship, 
networking opportunities, publicity, and then we give away $400,000 in no strings attached cash every year. And I'm here today because our application is actually currently open. We have a life science uh, specific division that is perfect for some of these presenters today. It is completely free. All you need to do to register is to be a Minnesota based company and less than a million dollars in revenue. So very open, um, you can go to mincup.org to check out our application and I encourage you all to apply by April 12th. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deb Miedema, and as Kaylin mentioned, I'm part of the Home Center for Entrepreneurship. I'm here as part of the MinCore team. Uh, at MinCore, we are dedicated to trying to ensure that everyone, diverse folks, uh, including research scientists, community-based innovators, uh, everyone has an opportunity to learn the business skills that they need to be commercially successful. So we provide entrepreneurial education programs that are, again, free of cost, uh, available. You can check out our website, mincore.umn.edu. Um, and I would say that the best way that you could learn more is just to go and check out that website. Thank you. All right. Huge thank you to both of you. These are fantastic programs. All right. Who is ready? for the mid-level, our last division of today. So we have six companies who are going to be competing today in the mid-level division. We have an incredible panel of judges. We may have had a couple changes here. Is Jeff joining in this one? Hello, Jeff. Um, your picture's not up here, I'm sorry. Um, but a lot of this expertise, as with our junior division, spanning academic science, tech, investment, entrepreneurship. So we're so grateful that you are here today with us. Back to fishing. First off, we are going to have James Graybaugh with Objective Biotechnology. Um, in vibe, you are on deck. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. I'm James Graybaugh, CEO of Objective Biotechnologies. We're a one-year-old engineering firm that's commercializing research laboratory equipment that's being developed at the University of Minnesota by a very well-rounded team of founders that has expertise in robotics, artificial intelligence, neurotechnology, genetics, and we have two entrepreneurs who have previously sold startups. I personally have 27 years of experience selling laboratory equipment into this marketplace. This is our flagship, the auto injector. It's the first instrument to fully automate microinjection into multiple model organisms for research. This is a picture of microinjection in in vitro fertilization, a future market for the system. Today, it's designed to meet the needs of thousands of laboratories worldwide that microinject CRISPR gene editing tools into the developing embryos of the model organisms pictured here. Their discoveries provide the tools for future biomedicine, and they do a lot of microinjection. Here's the problem. Microinjection is a very difficult, precise procedure. It's a bottleneck. It's slow, expensive, and highly variable. A laboratory with the auto-injector can train multiple technicians to inject at four times the speed of a human being with uh, a quarter of the labor and tight control over injection parameters, essentially removing this bottleneck and unlocking the technology. Our system was recently published in the Journal of Genetics and presented at a scientific conference. And the scientific research community's response has been energizing and validating. We already have a, a robust and rapidly expanding sales pipeline. We've generated almost $120,000 in billable revenue with another $100,000 forecasted before mid-year. If we're able to meet our goal of placing over one system a month with contributing revenue from consumables and service plans at a blended margin of over 70%, we have line of sight to profitability by the end of 2025. We're raising capital in a seed round, so frankly, we can move out of our founder's basement and start building these systems at scale. Thanks for the presentation, James. That was great. The first question I have is about onboarding time in your data set models. How long does that take, and are you able to get up fast for a, a certain lab? 
we're in the process of beta testing in the field. We have MVPs that uh, our customers are paying for. Two of them are here at, on the university campus, and two of them are external, one at Baylor College of Medicine and one at Genalia Farms, which is an HHMI research institute in Virginia. And we're in the process of making sure that we have a good understanding of the support required to make sure that our customers can utilize the system effectively. Uh, impressive presentation, impressive team in a very hot space. So question I have for you is, um, are you able to share what each system costs and the business model for what you get up yearly or what sure. you expect over the time of the device? Sure, I actually have that right here. So uh, our average selling price, we currently modeled it out at $75,000 a system. An average laboratory will consume about $5,000 worth of uh, injection needles. Um, it could be qu uh, quite a bit more for some laboratories that do a lot of this work. Service contracts will be $10,000. So we anticipate $80,000 in year one with a revenue tail of $20,000 a year. We conservatively estimated about a four-year lifespan for $140,000 total value. Uh, terrific presentation. Thanks, James. Um, in thinking about how fast you're going to be able to inject uh, cells, uh, what's the next bottleneck that, will, that you'll envision this technology creating? I mean, how many cells do you have to do, and how can you screen those cells to understand if they've been effectively injected with whatever uh, you're trying to get in there? You know, I'm going to ask my co-founder, Daryl, to see if he can address that. He's our chief scientific officer. Daryl, are you able to talk about the next technical challenge for the system? He's right here. Um, yeah, so you know, you're, you're right that you know, you, you when you inject into into an embryo, you then have the problem of having to screen them, and so that differs depending on what sort of organism you're injecting. So our, our initial prototype was developed with fruit flies, where you know you can you can grow up and screen a lot of those, um, but you know th there there are going to be other systems where um, the the downstream labor becomes limiting. Now, the, the, the value of creating some of those reagents then becomes much larger. So like the, the mouse, uh, like mammalian markets, or, or for instance, like li uh, gene editing and livestock animals, you might have lower throughput, but the actual value of what you're producing is much higher. So we think it, it'll sort of cancel out. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Daryl. So uh, great, great presentation, James. Uh, quick question on intellectual property and the competitive landscape here. Just love if you could expand a little bit more about, you know, I, you know, I, I hear the data say does it data sets machine learning, uh, you know, prize a differentiator, but I'm curious uh, who else is here and sure. and how you'll be differentiated. Let's see, I do have a competitive slide. So from a hardware perspective, most of the competitors are the manufacturers of manual injection systems or the com or the components that are used to assemble those workstations. Our, frankly, we believe that our largest competitor is going to come from the service provider network that's available to the laboratories that, that do a lot of this work. And the feedback that I've been getting from customers who came by our booth at the Allied Genetics Conference last week in Washington, D.C., is that it's expensive to do anything that's off-menu. And so we believe that you know, the key opinion leaders out there that are the real Jedi Knights in this technique, are gonna, they're always going to do it themselves. And they'll see our platform as enabling, removing that bottleneck. And we'll have a robust uh, secondary market of groups that want to work with mosquitoes. And we have a group here at the University of Minnesota that's working with Asian carp. So I had to mention some fish in this setting, right? <laughs> it's trying to make the world a better place for actual walleyes. So um, uh, Daryl, you're maybe the best person to address the intellectual property piece. <laughs> yeah, we have a, a patent a patent application that's been filed, and so we also have a license option from OTC. So the IP is owned by the University of Minnesota, but the company is licensing that. Thank you very much. All right. There we go. All right. Next up, we have Diego Taunton with InVibe and Davenport Safety Systems. You are up next. Hello, I'm Diego, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at InVibe. At InVibe, we're bringing the science of epigenetics to life. 
What if a simple saliva test could tell you how many cigarettes you smoked in the past year? What if it could tell you how much alcohol you've consumed in the past three months? Perhaps this is how you're feeling right now. <laughs> but I assure you, yes, it is possible. It's possible with the groundbreaking new science of epigenetics. Unlike genetics, epigenetics changes with your lifestyle and environment. Using epigenetics, we can measure smoking history, alcohol history, diabetes, and heart risk. At Invive, the markers we use are patented and have been featured in over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers. The problem we're looking to address is the life insurance underwriting experience. In 2024, you still have to take an invasive blood test when you're applying for life insurance. It's been described as the greatest pain point in the $1 trillion life insurance industry. Our saliva test allows carriers to perform underwriting that's powerful, but also non-invasive. Our technology is designed to be cheap and, uh, and fast, $100 per test at scale. Beyond insurance, there are numerous opportunities in the health and wellness space, like monitoring healthy aging. Our team combines expertise in molecular biology, life insurance, and software development. Our CMO, Rob, is a world-renowned expert in epigenetics. Uh, the past epigenetic startup to come out of his lab, Cardio Diagnostics, is now publicly traded. To date, we have $25,000 in pilot revenue. We are, uh, we've been a part of two accelerators, and we're looking to fundraise a uh, $1 million pre-seed round. And so far, we have $200,000 committed. So if you're interested, reach out, and let's chat. Thanks for your time. Diego, thanks. Uh, terrific presentation. So you talked about me being concerned about how many glasses of wine I had last night. <laughs> But you also talked about insurance providers and healthcare providers. I mean, who is the customer for, for what you're envisioning? Which of those groups are you going to focus on, and how are you going to get to them? Yeah, so in this case, the, uh, the insurance carrier is our primary customer. We also have secondary customers who are the agents who are actually distributing the policies in the field, right? So they want to see, they, they want to have less sales friction when they're selling policies, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's inconvenient if you're trying to sell life insurance policy and you have to tell the client, hey, we have to stick you with a needle and draw blood, right? So a saliva test is something that improves their experience and then also for the life insurance carrier, it helps them um, assess risk better and just have more profitability overall. Uh, two questions. One, I uh, read, first of all, love your use of funds. Um, don't see that <laughs> enough. Um, but your investment from Plug and Play BC, that's fantastic. But they invest in a lot of deals. Um, what are your expectations from them? Do you see them as a follow-on investor? And then my second question is legality. Um, I don't know how excited people would be to... <laughs> give us information. Maybe I don't know this uh, market well enough that maybe it's accepted that this is something you have to do to get life insurance. So I'm curious about that. Yeah. So just to clarify, we're, we're currently raising a pre-seed round. We have 200,000 committed, 100,000 of that, as you mentioned, from plug and play. Um, and so, yeah, regarding the, I have a couple of backup slides. So regarding the legality, um, the current state of the market is to use a blood test right, to stratify someone's risk. And so that'll look at things like your health history, cholesterol, stuff like that. So there is a baseline level of invasiveness in this process, especially if you're buying a life insurance policy that has a bit more, well, it's a bit uh, higher in value. In terms of the regulatory compliance, um, so we're, we're not using, so any pricing, any new pricing tools are under higher scrutiny, right? We're not using AI. We're probably the only startup in the world to be advertising that in this investment environment, but we're not using AI. That makes things easier from an underwriting uh, regulatory environment perspective. Uh, the former Illinois Insurance Commissioner uh, wrote a report saying that using epigenetics is consistent with policy norms. And uh, we did a 2021 study showing that our epigenetic mortality index didn't show any evidence of racial bias. So that's kind of our, our regulatory standpoint. Thanks, you. Great presentation. The one question I have is, are you holding all the liability risk of the genetics information that you have? And how are you anonymizing that to not cause a like cyber risk that we've seen with a couple of the other genetic uh, testers. Yeah, so I mean we're we're, um, we're doing basically like the the um, the standards that we have in place are, are pretty um, traditional for the field, right? So standard privacy, working on like HIPAA compliance. Um, you're talking about like data concerns for privacy. 
Yeah, so I mean, just like the standard, like purging user data after it's no longer any useful for the business use case. Um, because we're using epigenetics as opposed to genetics, I think that distinction is an important one for kind of the privacy aspect because your epigenetic information is kind of like, um, it, it's, it changes with your lifestyle, right? So it's kind of like your cholesterol as opposed to genetics is something that's seen as a little bit more, okay, well now we know like your family history or uh, we can you know, link you to a, a criminal that was convicted or something like that. So it's a little bit different in that respect with the, the nature of the data we're collecting, but still the standard privacy procedures that we're taking. Uh, thanks, Diego. Really interesting presentation and, and technology. I'm, I'm curious, uh, just to clarify, is the, the, the test a replacement to the blood draws? So I'm hearing as a benefit, is it able to capture all the same information? I'm thinking of insurance, right? Cholesterol, all the other things that it collects. Yeah. Or is it adjunctive, that it's so, still going to require both? Great question. I have slides for this, actually. So the, uh, we did a head-to-head -head comparison with the blood test. We actually found that the epigenetic markers that we use um, outperformed it in a head-to-head -head comparison. Um, and that was using data from 2,000 2, individuals um, in a study with 290 deaths. We found that there is a, a strong um, ability to separate risk. The reason that we're able to outpredict the blood test in this instance is because we're actually measuring two things with our test. We're, we're measuring biological risk and social risk because by focusing on smoking and alcohol, we're identifying individuals not only who have a higher level of health risk, but also individuals who are more um, uh, who are more likely to do risky uh, behaviors, right? Like going out and getting into an accident or something like that. So that's why we can see a larger mortality separation compared to a traditional blood test. In the last 15 seconds, you said patented markers. Do you own the patents on the markers? So working with um, my CMO at the University of Iowa, um, he's a world-renowned expert in epigenetics. He holds the patents here. And yeah, so we're excited to work together in this industry and create some change. All right, thank you, Diego. Um, one of the, in the judges shuffle, um, this in the junior division, we didn't get a chance to shout out one of the other judges, which is Mary McCarthy, where are you? Um, if you've been to Wall, I think, before on campus at the University of Minnesota in the last few years, um, Mary was responsible for all of that. So huge thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Next up, we have Ryan Davenport with Davenport Safety Systems. Mag Techshin, you are on deck. Hi, everybody. I'm Ryan Davenport. <clears throat> uh, I'll bet everybody in this room knows an older adult who suffered a fall uh, and had a terrible injury. Well, it's a $50 billion public health crisis. Look, fall prevention is a great idea, but it has, it's not working. Uh, more than one in four older adults falls each year. And after the first fall, older adults are twice as likely to fall again. That's why we're building the safety vest. <clears throat> it's a 360-degree wearable fall protection from the hips up to the head. Because look, if we can't prevent our loved ones from falling, let's protect them when they do, whether they're at home or in assisted living or memory care. The safety vest uses a motion sensor to detect a fall in real time. Airbags inflate in less than half a second, and then they deflate to absorb the impact. It's reusable and non-stigmatizing. For decades, and even today, fall protection has really been underwear with special padding over the hips. But five years ago, crash vests came out for motorcyclists and downhill skiers. Uh, great for them, not a great option for my grandparents. Uh, there are a few airbag belts in the pipeline, but they only protect the hips, and that's not good enough. Think about traumatic brain injuries. Falls uh, are the number one cause for seniors over 65. Our team includes the leading fall researcher in the US, a long-term care expert, a CFO, a social scientist. Jay Davenport's idea for the safety vest was informed by his 30-year career as an orthopedic surgeon on the Iron Range. We have a patent, a fully functional prototype. Senior care leaders tell us they need this now because in the US, an older adult falls every second of every hour. Thank you. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, so thanks for a very interesting presentation. And I also had the chance to look at your, your website as well. Um, I am curious if this is a medical device or a wellness product and what your decision about that has meant for your business model. We're actually, it's neither. We're calling it a safety technology. Um, we see this as very similar to a life jacket that you would wear on the water, but this is the life jacket on the land. And so um, we'll have to navigate some of those regulatory issues as we go forward, but we have the functioning prototype, and our instincts tell us that there may be, uh, this may be not require an FDA um, classification if it's in the consumer realm. Uh, it may need some sort of a, like a class one type classification if it's going to be used for long-term care organizations, uh, hospitals. Uh, so we'll just have to kind of play that by ear, but manufacture it from the beginning in a way that will work either way. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Really nice presentation. I, I thought I actually saw something similar in this out in the marketplace. Can you comment on some of the recent competition out there and how you differentiate? Sure. So I've seen something called an S airbag. It's a Chinese product, and they're all over social media, which good for them. Um, but one thing I would say about that is, from what we can tell from all the videos, what separates uh, ours from what they're doing is that we have deflation built into the airbags so that there is an opportunity to decelerate when you, before you hit the floor. That, that with, it's, if you think of a mattress, like a camping mattress or something, that you take the, the air nozzle off, you would slowly sink to the floor. That's kind of our, our approach that differentiates. And when you watch their videos, they inflate really firm and bounce. So I think that's a critical difference because we're talking about concussion or contra coup, sort of a bounce back injury. So my biggest concern is adoption. Have you done any focus groups with elderly people? Who makes this recommendation? Is it the caregiver? Is it the child? Is it the physician? Who's, right, who's that's, making that's a great decision? question. Um, we've talked to caregivers, uh, people who are caring for their own loved ones. Uh, we've talked with uh, nursing home operators, physicians, and even paramedics. Uh, one thing that we're finding is that if we start with people who already have a history of falls, and maybe history of falls with injury, the feedback that we're getting is that they'll work with something that will allow them to not go through that experience again. So yes, we're gonna make it look uh, like regular clothing, uh, but we want it, it's what's inside that's really gonna make the difference. And we think that seniors who wanna stay active, wanna be independent, uh, are gonna be very willing to, uh, to adopt this technology. Because it's gonna look like regular clothing it's just going to have a very uh, specific purpose. I think that is a big, big interesting part is the look of it um, uh, in, a, in a good way. I, I'm curious about, um, is it just a hardware solution or are you also thinking about uh, connectivity or notification, first responders, right, when these events do happen? Right. Yeah, so it will, on deployment of the airbags, it will send a notification to a nurse's station or to... Uh, some central uh, care center, uh, or it would go to a loved one, so notifying them that the airbags have gone off. And also, um, uh, we're gonna ha make this uh, activated through an iPhone app, an iOS system, or whatever platform will work. So it'll be able to not only activate with an iPhone, um, it will monitor like biometrics and fitness and other, other things that are kind of out there, but will make, the, make it versatile that way. Uh, and yeah, it's, the idea is we want it to be as simple to use as possible, so it won't require the iPhone use, but it certainly can be uh, augmented with an iPhone. Now, if I can ask a follow-up of cost, yes. ASB, what are you thinking yeah. about? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, it costs about $500 to make it, so from there, we, that's how we start with trying to figure out what the, uh, what the retail price would be. This needs to be Medicare approved, and so, uh, you know, when we go from the prototype to testing and then to pilot studies, it's that data from the pilot studies that will uh, really support our case for Medicare reimbursement. I mean, they're, they're reimbursing scooters, and we think they should reimburse something that will help people stay active. Great presentation, Ryan. Have you ever thought about doing a tuck-in or add-on to a current emergency provider 
program, something like, like a LifeLock or something that alerts somebody when they fall? You know, it's, it's in the realm. I mean, we're trying to figure out how best to fit. Um, those are nice innovations because they do let people know that something's happened. Obviously, we think it's too late at that point. Someone's already fallen and hurt themselves. Uh, so, but we are going to keep our eyes open for an opportunity to partner our technology. And we're going to use every avenue we can. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Dr. Jinping Wang from MagTechshin and Century DX, you are up next. Thank you. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to present uh, MagTechshin to you. I'm founder of MagTechshin. Uh, what's the problem? So COVID-19 alone already pro proved we need a rapid, sensitive, cost-effective, and point of care testing. And MacTaction positioned well to provide this solution to address these uh, big problems. So we developed the prototype, as I'm showing here, that provides the speed, handheld, and the low cost, and to address all those challenges we are facing. And the MagTechshin technology compared to existing product as being shown here. And this has been proved by our past almost 10 years experiment data based on the real samples, including uh, flu samples and the SARS-CoV virus sample detections. That gives us a high sensitivities, time to result with five minutes, and the cost is low and no need for experienced technician. What's the business? And this business market is huge. And this ranged from medical rapid testing to water testing to food safety testing. Overall, it's a $73 billion market. MagTechshin positioned to access some of them. Just using 5%, we got a $3.6 billion market. The team, we have a wonderful team and being assembled in the past few years. And then the key team members, you add up all the experience, including technology, business development, and the bio IC development, about 50 years, although we still look young. <laughs> what do we ask? We ask money, basically the CD wrong, we ask for one million to up to two million dollars. We recruit CEO, I'm a professor, I'm not running this full time. And then we also recruit marketing expert in the IVD field. With that, I ready to answer the question. Uh, Dr. Wang, uh, impressive, impressive team. Um, and so, so impressive that I almost don't understand the technology. So um, I'm more interested in the business model, especially distribution. Um, and then you allude to needing funding. Do you, where, where do you plan to look for that, or how do you plan to fund this? OK, yeah. So I would like to call my business development team member to come here, high end. And then one cat, you can come up. I can also quickly, the first part. So, so we, have, uh, we have the business plan. You know, we call the stage-wise business plan. And then the first uh, MVP product we target on SWAT. Uh, market. So that one we already started for you know past uh, 10 years. Its overall market is 1.1 billion. And then through the past few years interview with 20 most important customer, and then we know we at least can access 5% market right away if we have the product as we just uh, showing. So that's 50 uh, million dollar market. And then next stage will be go to human market. That's FDA approved one. And as we talk about the, you know, uh, 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 the flu and the COVID and the many others, and then we can target on that as a 3.5 billion market. Yeah. 
And then, Kayan, you have something to add? Yeah. I think you already covered, yeah, we did a full uh, market sizing. I mean, we look at the human market, the animal, both the dairy and the meat animal market, and by different animal, we look at pet market, and just uh, considering the ease of entry, our expertise, our connections, we decided to use the swine market uh, as an entry point. Uh, to the risk and to certainly get initial funding for our future uh, expansion. Thank you. Yeah. I have a uh, kind of like a unit economics being summarized here. And this technology is so wonderful and uh, give us a big margin, about 80% to 90% uh, contribute margin. That's a pretty high, you know, in the medical device. Uh, not just talk about it for the food animal market. Uh, what, what's the sample type for this device? What's that? What is the sample type from the patient? Sample, right. Yeah. So, Spit, blood, urine. Yeah. So, so this technology is a platform technology, as I just listed on here. And we already demonstrated the prototype, so it's any kind of liquid sample we can handle. Right. So that's you know, another big advantage. So that's why we bear, dare try to target on the bigger you know, market, not just narrow down to one. Yeah. And then I, we're, I, probably everyone in this room is taking a COVID test in their home at this point. Yeah. Those are pretty cheap and pretty easy to use. Yeah. It looked like, you know, your prototype looked like a box with, device, with, uh, with stuff. It looks more expensive than what I uh, used. <laughs> the yeah. swab I shoved up my nose for, for two years during COVID. Yeah, yeah. So, so this one is uh, actually we, we interview with the customer, you know, and then we know if you make it too small, sometimes it also is very inconvenient. And then this size, just right at the size, put in the you know, household, right? If you have multiple you know, sample to test, this exactly fit to that need, yeah. Mm. yeah. So you're talking about using that device with multiple different assays. You exactly, can yeah. Out. yeah. If you look at uh, you know, the sample, this is a, a wire we just showing on the screen. That's a teeny tiny sample. So you just replace every time that's the keys you used. That's what we call the platform technology because you never know it's COVID two, COVID three, and then some others, right? Yeah. So I'm at home with my family. A great presentation. Uh, so I'm at home with my family, and I think somebody has the flu. I'd go straight to this device to check to see if they have the flu, so we can get them care right away, so that other people don't get affected in the household. That's kind of the, the business case I'm thinking about. Every household would have one of these. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly. Yeah. And then you can see with this app based is the, you know, the Apple or Android system. So we develop Android system and Apple system. You know, this. Uh, if you look at the business plan, uh, you know, we have uh, this so called uh, uh, software uh, subscription. That's another part of the business plan. So basically, make people feel very easy to access. Yeah. And just, you might have said it already before, but you've tested these diseases. You're planning on going to X, Y, Z diseases, which would give you better market penetration. So just trying to get the lay of the land of where you are and where you're going. Yeah, so we start from, we call the you know, stage-wise uh, uh, market plan, right? You start from SWAT 1 to the you know, flu and to the COVID. COVID we already handled very well, and then come to human market again. So basically that's the plan. All right, thank you, Dr. Wang. Next up, we have Matt Nelson from Century DX, and then Femicorp, you're up next. Hi, my name is Matt Nelson, and we're developing a test to diagnose residual cancer from a blood draw called the liquid biopsy, which can get FDA approval. Cancer impacts many lives. This technology specifically focuses on helping those who have completed treatment but still have minimal residual disease. The current standard of care is not sensitive enough to detect residual cancer in a large percentage of patients. The goal is to give additional treatment to those who need it while the cancer can still be treated to cure. Competitor clinical trials have proven that a blood draw or liquid biopsy 
can save lives by providing additional treatment to those with minimal residual disease. However, these technologies are not yet the standard of care because they have not received FDA approval. Despite completing multiple clinical trials, these companies have not even submitted their first module for FDA approval. I started this company to get MRD testing to those who need it, which means getting FDA approval. For FDA approval, the technology has to be effective, highly sensitive, but also safe, which means standardized with the quality control system. We think we have a path to FDA approval. Our technology it, um, falls within the FDA guidance on IVDs, and we are much more sensitive compared to the currently approved FDA liquid biopsy tests. Those tests are not sensitive enough for minimal residual disease testing, so they only have approval for companion diagnostics. By blocking normal DNA during PCR, we're able to address the root cause of the four main problems with liquid biopsy. We have a highly sensitive and standardized test by taking a fundamentally different approach to the current top technologies. We are not the first company to develop a blocking technology, but we figured out why those other technologies were never able to achieve complete enrichment. We have amazing results, detecting low as a single copy. We hope to partner or license this technology for diagnosing cancer, but also with pharmaceutical companies for drug development. The key to our success will be others independently demonstrating the performance of this technology. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, I, I'm curious if you talk more about the, the, the cancers that you're looking at, and two, um, how you'll differentiate from GRAIL. So when, or when I'm thinking of liquid biopsies, the market you're going after, extremely similar, very different, I think, in the what it is. Yeah, uh, and the application, about, it's, like, it's very, very different from GRAIL. Very, very different from GRAIL. Um, so the cancers that we're going after, um, there's a lot in the colon rectal cancer. Um, it's kind of our first uh, feasibility proof of concept um, pilots that we did for those kind of key mutations in KROS, BRAF, um, EGRF, stuff like that. Um, when it comes to a revenue model from a business standpoint, a lot of the interest that we're getting is from um, large diagnostic companies that currently have PCR-based solutions that are not as effective for drug developers. So they're looking to kind of test our technology side by side uh, compared to them. And so that's where we kind of get our first licensing partnerships would be drug development um, and kind of working through those larger diagnostic companies. Um, Grail, what Grail does is they do methylation-based. Um, we're not methylation, we're, we're, we're DNA. Uh, it is a blood draw. Um, we're actually looking to be diagnostic. So Grail is, uh, you're going to test it and they'll think, oh, we think you have cancer. This is going to be a regulatory approved test that has performance standards. So Grail is like, we'll guess if you have uh, cancer based on an AI. This is, here's a performance standard. We know you still have this mutation in your body um, that shouldn't be there based on uh, tumor informed decisions. Uh, thank you, Matt. Can you talk a little bit about the pricing and the potential sales that you're looking at once you get out there? Yeah, so the test is extremely low cost. So one of the biggest issues in, is, is cost in this current field. Um, the approach for PCR is, is, is low cost, but not sensitive enough. Um, NGS is sensitive enough, but high cost, around uh, $3,500 what Medicare approves these tests for currently. Um, our cost structure is, at low volume is about $70 right now um, in a regulatory environment uh, with technologists and stuff like that. We, we predict it would be around $150 um, for, for our COGS. Thank you very much. All right. Our last presenter of the night, day, afternoon, I don't know what time it is. We have Pam Cole of FemCorp. Thank you. My name is Pam Cole, I'm a physical therapist and a certified wound specialist of 28 years, so I know tissue repair. I'm the president of FemCorp and the inventor of ShePack. The problem is that we have over 60 million women who suffer each year from vaginal inflammation that can present as pain, swelling, burning, or itch with the variety of diagnoses here. Yeast infections, after childbirth, periods of increased sexual intimacy, sexual challenges with menopause and chemo and surgeries, and I have anal concerns in the space. 
The solution is simple and elegant. It is an ice pack. The shape is novel and inventive. Icing is not novel and inventive. It's non-pharmaceutical. It empowers the patient to manage their symptoms on their own. It's reusable, safe, and made in Minnesota. And why now is that pelvic health and medicine has expanded. We are seeing physical therapists, nurse practitioners in women's health, and physicians in the sexual health and medicine clinics and urinary and incontinence clinics. People want natural solutions. This is a gender neutral product. It's no longer taboo to talk about pelvic health. And as you can see, this is a photo of Target on Tuesday. There is room and they are looking for both natural and traditional solutions. Why our product is best is the only product that cools the internal and external tissues and I hold the design patent. And I have a raving testimonials from women who have said that they've gotten their intimate lives back or their normal day-to-day -day lives back and being able to manage their symptoms. We have a really good margin on SheePack. We are selling on our website to some local boutique retailers and medical retailers. It's HSA and FSA reimbursable as an ice pack. And even if there were only 40 million issues and we captured 1% of the market and only sold it wholesale, we would make $8 million. So I can't do this alone anymore. I need a social media consultant. I need to advertise to clinicians and end users and make more product so you too can be cooler inside and out. <laughs>also how it's reusable. What, uh, okay, so the shape is what's novel and inventive. So we, right, so we've iced ankle sprains, back pain, that kind of stuff. And that has helped us decrease the chemicals of inflammation in the tissue. So by being able to insert this into the vagina and cool both the vaginal tissues and even behind in the, like the interstitial cystitis is a bladder inflammation. This actually helps with those symptoms. So it's to get rid of their pain, swelling, burning, itch by being able to insert and cool the internal and external tissue, so nothing else does that. So it's this shape, and it's very comfortable, actually, um, oddly. So <laughs> uh, what was your second question? It is reusable, so it uh, gets washed, goes in the freezer, upside down, by the way. So if you notice, there's some airspace in the upright picture, but it comes with a gusseted pouch. It gets flipped upside down, and then actually all that dead space goes away. It gets frozen in, in one's freezer, and then you take it out and use it whenever you. So it's a home. To, it's a home thing. Yeah. Yeah. How does it compare to pharmaceuticals out there? Is it equivalent, differentiate, or? So compared to pharmaceuticals, my understanding is right now there hasn't been a lot around pain management. Uh, so if someone has lichen planus, um, or uh, a lot of, like, let's say vulvodynia, so that's a pain syndrome. They're trying to insert ointments and goos into this space and then be intimate. And it's really challenging, it doesn't feel nice. And what's great is this can be used before and after and there's no mess um, and again, no prescription, but it's this ease of use. My understanding from my patients so far, and I guess customers, is that with prolonged use of CPAC, actually their overall chronic pain rate goes down, and I've had some say it's gone away, and the pharmaceuticals aren't doing that. They're just uh, either steroids or um, like gels that have a temporary effect for pain. So this seems to actually change Chemistry, I can't prove that yet, but it seems to be able to mitigate the chemicals of inflammation over time. So thanks very much. I, I am a great believer in these uh, pelvic PT people. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Truly life-changing. Um, many of the um, uh, uh, concerns that you raised are things that people don't necessarily go to professionals for. Right. Um, and you show this wonderful picture from Target. Mm -hmm. um, what are you thinking in terms of actually your go-to-market strategy? 
uh, so, to, to build this business. I, I love that. That's where I need the most help is because I do need to get, whoa, there is the hole. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do need to get, I want to do marketing and advertising, not just to the clinicians, but to the end users by Facebook ads, Instagram ads, and I am a clinician, and I don't have the same background in the social media advertising space, but I do think that advertising to postmenopausal women, female cyclists, um, those who've just given child, like pretty much the lifetime of a woman, so marketing to women, in their own homes, which means internet, you know, it means the phone, I believe anyway. Yes, the clinicians need to know about it and put their stamp of approval on it, but really um, uh, getting to uh, social media, the internet. Well, I, I would recommend that you go beyond social media and think okay. also about retail um, and, and get some advice on that piece as well. Thank you, because there is space. And I do see natural solutions, because I frequent that aisle often to you know, do market research. And um, getting into a target takes something. You have to show that you have the numbers, that you have the volume, you haven't, you know, your manufacturing is streamlined. And yes, I, that's the goal though, Target and Walgreens and CVS and those places, yeah. Uh, another quick question. Labeling, what are you, are you trying to make any actual claims with this? And if so, even with over the counter, you have to go through the FDA if right. you make any labels. So what, what does it do? So good news is uh, ice packs are not FDA regulated. So uh, like home safe on that one. The, oh gosh, so nervous. What's your first part of your question again? Uh, labeling. Labeling. Yeah, so I'm not, we're not going to state a cure. We're going to state relief. We are just stating relief and not a cure. Maybe there's a, a clinician who wants to do a study and then start to tell me, but I, I'd like that to be clinician driven, so relief, no cure. Thank you, Pam. All right, let's keep the round of applause going for all of our presenters, junior and mid-level. All right, judges, judges, both these judges and the junior judges, it is time for you to go deliberate. Um, if you're joining us online, we are gonna be returning to the broadcast after the judges' deliberation. For everyone else, please head out directly those doors into the atrium for refreshments, networking happy hour as we await the announcement of the winners. Thank you very much. Going to get started. My co MC Ron. Come on up here. All right, before we get started, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. This was a fantastic crowd. A lot of amazing, amazing presentations. Can we hear it for our presenters, for our judges, for our sponsors, our volunteers? This was a fantastic event. We really, really appreciate you being here today. Um, the judges have deliberated. They have chosen the winners, uh, but first we have a couple folks who are going to come say a few words. Um, as we mentioned, as we teased, this event itself is a true collaboration between the University of Minnesota, Mayo, and a bunch of other entities. Um, and I know I speak for all of us, especially on the University of Minnesota side, saying what a joy it is to work with this incredible Mayo team. Um, and so if you could give it up for the Mayo team and everyone at Mayo Clinic. It is such a joy to work with you all. With that, I'd like to invite up uh, the director of Mayo's Office of Entrepreneurship, Dr. Nathan Wiedemann. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I, I have the privilege of leading this fantastic team at, at Mayo, the Office of Entrepreneurship, the Office of Translation and Practice. And one of the best parts of my job every day is we are constantly exposed to and, 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 and get shown new technologies and we get to help marry those new ideas, those new innovations up with the resources that they need to move it forward. So we love being a part of events like this where exactly that is happening. And not just in the form of checks, but in the form of the connections that are being made in these conversations out here. So we love it and thank you very much to the uh, University of Minnesota team. Uh, absolutely fantastic job as always, a wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, thank you to, the to the, uh, uh, all of the presenters, all of the uh, competitors today. You put yourself out there, you took the risk, 
you put your ideas and yourselves out there. So thank you for doing that and coming here and, and showing us all of your amazing innovations today. So thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. So the other half of this partnership is, of course, University of Minnesota hosted a great event uh, from TechCom to medical school, home center, and more. It's a great institution, an integral part of this ecosystem. I'd like to invite Associate Vice President for Research, Technology, Commercialization, Rick Hibbish, up to say a few words. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, and uh, everybody else has given thank you, so I'll just add on my thank you to everyone else's. I just want to make quick, three quick things before we get to the unveiling of the winners. Uh, first of all, just an observation. I was talking to a few of you in the crowd here. Some of us uh, old timers who have been here 15 or more years, uh, we can't imagine. I was talking to John Stavig and Pat Dillon and a few others in the ecosystem. 15 years ago, you wouldn't have seen this many ecosystem players, this many startups, this quality of startups. So it's not just the quantity of startups, but the quality of startups and really seeing the ecosystem lean in. So it's been really uh, fun to watch the evolution of the Minnesota startup ecosystem, especially in the life sciences. And uh, we're, we're uh, looking forward to many more. We hopefully have some of them here. You heard Peter Crawford talk earlier about Minnesota MedTech 3.0. Lots of the ecosystem really le leaned into that, including the University of Minnesota. So we're excited about seeing that and seeing a, a, a large company like Medtronic, I don't know if we have anybody from Medtronic here, really lean into uh, the, to the community as well. So that's been, been very good. That's just kind of my first uh, point, which is just an observation. Uh, the second point, I'll do a quick commercial for what we do at the university. You heard about the other parts of this university, but every uh, large research university, and in fact a large institution like Mayo Clinic, has what they call a technology transfer office. So we work with the researchers. The researchers win lots of grants. In the case of the University of Minnesota, we've been over a billion dollars in research expenditures for the last several years on a path to 1.5 billion. That's a lot of research. That turns into some portion of that comes to our office as invention disclosures, and so our office helps do the intellectual property, the trademarks, the patents, and the, and the copyrights. And then we turn uh, some of those products and, or some of those uh, pieces of intellectual property through business development and relationships with all of you, we turn some of those into commercialized products and services, and that happens by doing licensing. And so our licensing can be to existing companies, the 3Ms, the Medtronics, the Ecolabs, but also to startup companies. We've been doing 20 to 25 startups for the last several years. That's a lot of startups, but those startups are only successful if we have a community, and a lot of you are helping make our startups successful. So that's just a quick commercial about our office. Uh, the last thing I want to mention before we get to the winners here, uh, we had uh, two new uh, fishing guides this year, uh, uh, sponsoring or uh, managing this event, and that's from our office, Maria Plessel and Katie Breslin. And so, um, I don't know if Russ is still here, but when you go on your fishing opener, Russ, I think you've got a couple of fishing guides that you can take in your boat with you. They're really experts at fishing. Um, but it's, it's great really to see uh, um, the event grow and grow, but also to have the, the participation of all of the new uh, entrepreneurs that are really putting themselves out there with their new ideas. And so with that, we'll uh, turn it back over for the winners. Thank you, Rick. Also, I want to mention um, Ron and Martin are also fairly new, right? And Nathan, you're new too. This is just a collection of new people. It's fantastic. All right, um, before we get started, um, Ron and Martin, can you come be nearish here? Because we have one more thank you. Um, Rena Hill, where is Rena? Where is she? Is she hiding? There you are. All right, come on up. We're gonna embarrass you. Rena has been the foundation of this event for quite some time. Uh, if you've been to this event, loved this event, uh, she's had a major hand in building this, growing this, and making it what it is today. She got a new job. So this was her last time serving as a walleye tank organizer. We are so grateful to you for your legacy and leadership and would like to present you with these honorary awards. So let's hear it for Rena. Thank you so much. All right, who's ready to hear the winners? All right. So. We're gonna start with the junior division. 
and we're going to start with the runners up. And with the junior division and runners up, we had a tie. So, the first of the runners up, each receiving $1,000 is Vertex Medical Solutions. So Vertex, come on up. Receive your award, your fancy check, take a picture with Ron and I. Hey, there he is, hey Mo. Yeah, congratulations. Our other runner-up, also receiving a comically large check for $1,000, is Emergence. Come on up. All right. On to the mid-level. They are very excited for you. The runner-up. What? Oh, <laughs> thank you. See, this is why you need a good team. I didn't announce the winner of the junior. Hold on. Thank you. The winner of the junior division, receiving $4,000, is Empower Independence Company. Here she comes. <laughs> All right. Now on to the mid level. Thank you, Martin. The runner up receiving four thousand dollars is. Devonport Safety Solutions. Come on up. Come on. Well, come on through. <laughs> <laughs> All right, congratulations. Yep, you can take that giant check on home with you. And the winner of the mid-level division, receiving $10,000 and a place in the Minnesota Cup semifinals is Objective Biotechnology. Come on up. Hold your giant size check. <laughs> Let's hear it for all of our incredible winners today. Um, before all of you presenters and judges leave, remember you're taking a picture up here and um, winners, you're gonna grab your prize at the end of this. Uh, huge thanks to all of you for attending. We hope to see you at the next Walleye Tank, which is happening at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, December 6th. Um, bars open till 6.30. And uh, companies, judges, come on up here. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.